As, uh, and I want to welcome you this morning on this Lord's Day to Woodward Park Baptist Church. We are glad that you have come and joined us as we worship the Lord Jesus Christ on this first day of the week, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the first day of the week. And so that we celebrate him today. I do want to give a special welcome to any visitors that are here this morning. If you are visiting with us, whether for the first time or you're newer to the church, we want to say welcome, that we are glad that you are here this morning. And we would love to hear about you and your visit. If you would be willing to fill out a connection card, which we have there by the door, we'd love to hear about you and your visit with us this morning. We also have a welcome gift for you if you stop by our welcome center out to the left after the service. And while you're there, if you're a new visitor or if you are relatively new visiting our church. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we have a breakfast with the pastor time. So next Sunday morning, if you are relatively new to our church, uh, on uh, next Sunday, June 6th at 9 a.m. during the life group hour before church starts, come here into the worship center and we're going to have a breakfast with you where you can meet Pastor Rick and he gets to meet you and you get to hear and ask questions and, and learn a little bit more about our church. And so we'd love to invite you to that. Uh, Please sign up at the Welcome Center for that, and so we can plan for who is coming next week. Um, Some other things that are going on is that last week, and then again this week, uh, the registration is open for VBS, for Vacation Bible School. Yeah, that is definitely praiseworthy. And so we are excited about that. We're excited for what the Lord is going to do about that uh, and do with that. And so uh, so parents' registration's open. The information is there. We have some outreach cards to hand out, but there's some some things we have to fix on that so that we'll have those, Lord willing, available next week. Uh, One thing to be praying about is that we are still short on teachers, especially the, the volunteer position of teachers and talking with the other church and looking through the registration position. And so if you're available during that week and could teach, that'd be wonderful. Or if you can't, just be praying about that the Lord would provide for that need. Uh, Something else coming up tonight, which is very exciting, is tonight we have the church picnic. And so that's going to be a great time. Bring your friends, bring your family. Uh, We're going to have different games and activities and that double barrel uh, water slide coming for some of the kids. And so that's going to be a great time. So bring food for your family and we're going to have dessert and and drinks for, for tonight. And then something else coming, another time, wonderful time of fellowship, is in two Sundays. So in two Sundays, we're going to be having a barbecue and car wash fundraiser to help send the youth to camp this summer. So in two Sundays. So mark that out in your calendars. Plan to stay after church that day. Bring your checkbooks. And we're going to help send the, the kids to camp this summer. It should be a wonderful day of fellowship. Have a great barbecue that Richard Har is preparing, as well as get your cars washed and, and help send the kids to camp. Uh, and so those are the announcements this morning. But let us, let us uh, turn to what we're really here to do, and that's to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to call us to worship by reading for us this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, where Paul writes, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up to glory. Father, we do pray that you would help, ah, help us to, to focus in our eyes on the things above, to, to focus on Christ, our Savior, this morning and the grace that he has given us and the, and the, the glorious victory that he has achieved in his death and res- resurrection, that he and you would be glorified this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, church, would you stand up and uh, worship with us this morning? We're going to open up our hearts, pour our praises out, and do a little singing and shouting this morning. Spirit sing, it makes my spirit sing, it makes my spirit sing. 
and grace that washes all our shame away. What could be better than your great love? What could be better than the grace that leads us home and makes a way? What could be better than your great love? We will sing and shout, yeah, sing and shout. Open up our hearts and pour your praises out. We will sing and shout, yeah, sing and shout. Open up our hearts and pour your praises out. We will sing and shout, yeah, sing and shout. Open up our hearts and pour your praises out. We will sing and shout, yeah, sing and shout. Amen. Let's continue worshiping and singing of His grace, which is enough for us.
I may have shared this story before, but uh, this story comes to mind um, every Memorial Day weekend for me. And it's uh, when I was teaching at Hawaii Baptist Academy, one of the things that we would do would be to take the students over to Pearl Harbor and have them do the Arizona Memorial. We would tour the Mighty Mo. But one of the things we got to do that was unique was go to the Utah Memorial, which is on the opposite side of Ford Island. And it's a ship that also sank and very similar to the Arizona. A lot of people died on that. And we were there with our sophomores, and just uh, by God's grace and sovereignty, a survivor uh, came down with his family. And uh, what I remember is just, he, he asked if he could address the class, and what are you going to say, right? Like, yes, you can address the class. And he just said, you, you don't know how much it means to know that people still remember. And uh, so we want to remember those that have died uh, serving our country in that way. And, and I'm always curious, and if you wouldn't mind, if, if you know someone that has given their life for our country, uh, would you raise your hand? Wow. It's, it's always a lot more than I realize, and so I, I appreciate that. Um, let me read our scripture this morning, and then we're going to pray, all right? This is from Psalm 119, uh, verses 97 through 104. It says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. Let's pray. God, we pray that what the psalmist writes would be the state of our hearts, Lord. That we would love your law more than anything else, Lord. That we would find joy in your precepts. That we would find your words sweeter than honey. And God, we pray that you would help us to remember that in your law is where we find wisdom. God, there are so many things as we go through life that we need help with, that we need wisdom with, Lord. We, we need wisdom in how we deal with the people around us, Lord, in, in our marriages, in our uh, families, Lord, as we parent, as children, as we uh, seek to, to be godly children in the way we obey our parents, Lord. And even as we grow up, Lord, how we honor and respect our parents, Lord, how we work. Lord, there are so many things that we need wisdom in. And then in our personal lives, Lord, how we grow in you and how we battle sin, Lord, we need your wisdom. But God, we are confident and we know that there is wisdom in your word. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to love your word. We thank you for the gift of your word. And God, we pray that you would just help us to be a shining light as we live in this world. And God, as we come together this morning to worship, we realize that we don't worship in a vacuum, Lord. We are, we are a part of this world, a part of this country, Lord, a part of this state, and a part of this city, God. And Lord, we pray that you would bring salvation to those that don't know you, Lord, that we would be a faithful witness here. And God, we pray especially this morning for those who are mourning as they come to Memorial Day weekend where there is a name, where there is a face, a person that they know, Lord, that has given their life. Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort to those families, Lord. God, we pray that we would remember those that have given their life for us, Lord, and what a blessing it is to live in this country with these freedoms, God. And these freedoms did not come cheaply, Lord. And so, God, we pray that we would be good citizens and remember. And, Lord, as we remember those that have given our lives, it reminds us of those that are serving today, Lord. And we pray that you would uh, protect our soldiers, our airmen, our Marines, Lord, that you would protect uh, our seamen, Lord, that you would protect those that serve in the Coast Guard, Lord, that um, you would protect them physically, Lord, but more importantly, God, we pray that you would bring salvation to them, Lord. We pray for the chaplains that are serving, that are sharing the gospel with these men and women as they go out around the world, Lord, and put themselves in harm's way. Lord, we pray that the reality of life and death 
would bring them to salvation. God, we pray you would save people in our military. And God, we pray that you would just, again, help us in our context as we have opportunity to be bold in sharing the gospel. Lord, we pray this morning for Tony Teeley. Um, Lord, as he had a stroke uh, last week, Lord, we thank you that he seems to be recovering very well from that, Lord, but we pray you would just bring healing to his body, Lord, that you would lower his blood pressure, God, that uh, they would be able to find a doctor that would be able to take uh, up his case and figure it out, Lord, and, and um, just work in him, Lord. I pray you would strengthen he and Kay as they go through this, Lord, in their faith and in their trust of you, God. Um, and it's times like this, Lord, where we often grow in you, and so, Lord, we pray that you would grow them. God, we, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of being able to pray to you. And as we continue in worship, we pray that you would use our, our singing, that you would use your word to mold us and shape us, Lord. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you guys stand again? We're going to sing one more song before Pastor Rick comes up and gives his message. We'll be singing the song, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know the same. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 22 this morning. 
Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to Pastor Craig before uh, he made his announcements, and so I just want to answer a couple questions that were asked of me this morning. Um, the one that several of you asked was, are adults allowed to go down the water slide? Yes, you are. Um, we... That would be bring great joy to the rest of us to see you do that. So, um, yes, that is not limited to uh, the children. Just make sure there are no small children at the bottom before you go. Um, but we do look forward to, to having fun uh, this evening. We're going to set up volleyball net, nine square cornhole, and something else. Seems like the water slide. So uh, we're looking forward to this afternoon. Um, as we get into First Peter this morning, as I, I looked at this, um, I was reminded uh, of reading books in middle school, and when the teacher would assign the book, one of the questions that was always asked was, are we required to read the introduction and preface? Because we wanted to read as little of the book as possible, and that was always more um, that was added to the beginning, so you prayed and hoped that the teacher would not ask you to read the introduction and preface, and there was always a groan when we were told, yes, we did have to read that. And um, as I've grown and, and matured, I, I've learned that oftentimes the preface is very, very important to the story. It gives you information. It, it tells you maybe a little bit beforehand, and it's usually pretty short compared to the rest of the story, but there's important information that is there. And a point that Peter is making is he talks to these um, Christians that are suffering is that suffering is really a preface to eternity, that the suffering that we go through in this life is very short compared to what eternity will be. And living in this fallen world and suffering is not the totality of, of who we are or what our existence will be. That This is a short time. And so the, the, the story in, in the, the longer part of the story, I would take you back to chapter 1 and remind you of what Peter said um, beginning in verse 3. He says, According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And so the trials living in this world, it's, it's a short thing. That This is really the preface to our eternity. And if we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior, if you've done that, the reality is that you look forward, you have a living hope, you have a firm confidence that your eternity will be an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and that God is keeping it for you. That's what we look forward to. And as we look at our passage today, in verse 18, Peter is going to remind us that Jesus suffered. But then you get down to verse 22, and we're reminded that the suffering is not the totality of Jesus' story. It's not who he is in and of itself. And as Peter, or as Paul, reminds us of, of who Jesus is, I would like to read Philippians 2.9 for you, where Paul says, Therefore God has highly exalted him, talking about Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is Jesus' story. That is who Jesus is. And last week, Pastor Craig served us so well by reminding us that we are to be ready to tell people of our hope, of what our future is. And our hope is not wishful thinking. Our hope is a firm confidence in Jesus Christ, in who he is as the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's what our hope is in. And so the best way for a Christian, I think, to be motivated, um, to be at peace, to be relaxed, to be rid of anxiety that comes from living in a fallen world is to be reminded of who Jesus Christ is. And that's what Peter does today as he takes us to this passage as he's talked about what it is like to live in this world and to 
um, have to be subject to government and subject to bosses and how husbands and wives relate to one another. He now comes to this point and he says, oh, by the way, you're supposed to be ready to give uh, an argument for your hope at any time. And now he shifts and says, let me remind you of who Jesus is. And this is your motivation. This is what you hold fast to. So let me read this passage for us. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Thank you. It's a good wife that sees you looking through your pockets and knows what you're looking for. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. For Christ also has suffered, suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers, having been subjected to him. This is God's perfect, holy, and complete word for us this morning. Let's pray. God, we pray that as we look at your word that you would use it to mold us, that you would use it to fall more in love with you, God, that you would remind us that you indeed are King of kings and Lord of lords. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As you go through this uh, paragraph, there is a lot here that we can get distracted by. There's a lot here uh, that we can spend time talking about that I think is not the main point. And just sticking with that idea of the preface and the main part of the story, I would uh, break this up this way, that verse 18 is the preface, verse 22 is the story, that's the long uh, reality of who Jesus is, and that everything in between there is really footnotes. It's, it's helpful information, it's good information, but it's not the main point. And so as we go through this, let's talk about the preface. What is it that Jesus did? That's where Peter goes to as he wants to encourage these people. What did Jesus do for them, for Christians that were scattered around the world? What did he do for us? So it says the first thing, for Christ also suffered once for sins. Christ suffered once for sins. This is an important thing for us to know, that when Jesus died on the cross, his sacrifice was effective. His sacrifice was sufficient. There's no reason for him to be sacrificed again. There are those that believe that every time you take the Lord's Supper that um, the, the bread and the juice or wine literally becomes the body and blood of Christ and that Jesus is being sacrificed again every time the Lord's Supper is taken. That is not true. Jesus Christ suffered once. He died once. And his death on the cross was sufficient. There's nothing else that needs to be done. The writer of Hebrews spends a lot of time talking about this, and kind of the point of Hebrews um, is that Jesus is better than everything else. And one of the points that the writer of Hebrews makes, and let, we're going to walk through there, um, if you want to go to Hebrews chapter 2, one of the things that the writer of Hebrews makes the point of is that Jesus is a better sacrifice. He's better than all of the sacrifices that were offered before. Uh, out of all of those millions of animals that Jews had offered, Jesus is a better sacrifice because he is the last necessary sacrifice. What he did, it was completed on the cross. So we're going to walk through a few verses here in Hebrews that will just show you this. So in Hebrews 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 9, it says, "...but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels." namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Verse 17, Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Propitiation is a word that we don't use um, 
in normal everyday language, but it means that he, saw, he took God's wrath on the cross, that he stood in in our place. Go over to chapter 7, verse 27. It says, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for our sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he suffered for himself. Chapter 9, verse 12 He entered once for all into the holy places, not by a means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. And then verse 24 through 28, still in chapter 9, For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man once to die and after that comes the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once, to bear sins of many will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. And then over in chapter 10, verse 10, and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And then chapter 13, verse 12, so Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Does that drive it home? Jesus suffered once for you in your place on the cross to pay for your sins. And the writer of Hebrews, he doesn't just drive it home. He drives it home, puts it in the garage, turns the car off, and puts the kids to bed, right? Like when you get done reading Hebrews and you're like, Jesus died once in our place as a substitute for us. So Jesus suffered once once for sins. And then what's the next thing that Peter tells us? He says that it's the righteous for the unrighteous. What did Jesus do? He was the righteous person dying for unrighteous people. The New American Standard translates it the just for the unjust. Jesus, there was no judicial reason for Jesus to suffer. He had never broken a law. He had never committed a crime. He had never sinned in any way. Why did he suffer? He suffered because he is merciful, gracious, loving, kind, and merciful. He suffered to save us. Without his death on the cross, we would remain dead in our sins. We would remain under the judgment of God. We would remain under the wrath of God if Jesus had not died on the cross, if he had not suffered in our place, if he, the righteous person, had not suffered for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Charles Spurgeon says, God will spare the sinner because he did not spare his son. Jesus died on the cross for us. God gave his son for us. Jesus willingly laid down his life for us, the righteous for the unrighteous. He is the righteous one who suffered and died for the unrighteous. He is the just one that died for the unjust. And as I think about living in this world and and how do you battle doubt, how do you battle fear, how do you battle sin, how do you just battle weariness of pursuing God? So there are times, right, when we just get tired. How do you battle that? How do you grow in love for Christ and in boldness to proclaim the gospel? How do you grow in righteousness? I think one thing you can do is memorize this verse. Just remind yourself over and over again that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. I mean, the more we look at the cross, the more we remember what Christ did, the more we remember who Christ was, who Christ is, 
who we were, dead in our trespasses and sins, and God came and made us alive together with Christ. What an amazing gift. That's what we hold fast to. That's what our hope is tied to, right, is the reality of who Jesus is and what he did. You want to be encouraged, memorize this verse, and then remember Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, how will he not graciously give us all things? I know sometimes as, as we battle things and you know, sometimes we just think, well, I can't, I can't tell God I'm struggling with that sin again. I can't tell God I'm doubting again. Yes, you can. And it's not going to surprise him. And he's, he graciously wants to help. We just need to turn to him. We sang the song, um, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Um, and then there's the line, uh, I prove him or and or. I'm not sure those go exactly, but there's that line, I prove him or and or. It's not that I'm proving that God is great. It's that God is proving that he is great as I trust in him and he is faithful every time, every time, every time. Amen. And God is gracious and desires and wants to be faithful. We just have to trust and not lean on our own understanding. So this is what Jesus did. He suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. And what else did he do? Why did he do this? That he might bring us to God. That's, that's the ultimate goal, right? It is reconciliation. We have a holy, just, perfect, righteous God. And then there's us. Sinners, rebellious, serving our own passions and desires and loving it. And how do you reconcile that? How do you bring this together? We can't do anything to bring this together. We can't do anything to earn God's grace, to earn righteousness. And so what does God do? God provides Jesus Christ to, to die on the cross for our sins, to, to be the bridge that brings us to God. To God. And Jesus brought us to God. He, he brings reconciliation through Jesus Christ. That's what he did. And it says that he was put to death in the flesh. He really died. He didn't swoon on the cross and these soldiers all just thought he was dead and so they put him in a tomb and then you know the coolness of the tomb woke him up and he came back. The soldiers were good at killing people. like They knew when you were dead, right? And Jesus really died on the cross and then he was made alive in the spirit. He really came back to life he was resurrected, and he still lives today. It wasn't, there are people that were raised from the dead in the Bible, right? But they always died again. This is the resurrection where Jesus came back to life, and he, he stayed alive. And we see, I love that we see the uh, made alive in the Spirit, and so you see the, the Holy Spirit's role in all of this. The, the, the resurrection was a, a Trinitarian thing. The Father was raising Christ. Jesus laid down his life and took it back up. The Holy Spirit was involved in that. And his death and resurrection is what allows us to be reconciled to God, and it's what brings us near to God. And in Matthew 27, 51, there's the, uh, it tells us that when Jesus died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in two. And, and I just, I love that picture because I, it's that the veil of the temple is what separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat of God. When Jews thought about where is God, they were like, well, he's, he's with us. He, he's in our camp or he's in our city, but he, he's in the temple. When he was in the camp, he's in, he's in the tabernacle and he's, he's in the Holy of Holies. That's where the mercy seat is at. That's where God exists. And the, our priest goes in once a year and takes the blood and puts it on the mercy seat and makes um, atonement for our sins. And when Jesus died on the cross, that temple or that curtain was torn in two, and the significance of that is like is is the bring being brought near to God. We don't go to a priest anymore to carry blood into the holy of holies. We go directly to God, knowing that Jesus Christ offered a sacrifice once for all for our sins, and that sin is sufficient and effective. And so we go directly to God on the basis of what Jesus Christ did. There is no longer that separation. 
we go directly to God. Jesus' death and resurrection is what allows that. And I'm going to go back to Hebrews again, just Hebrews 4.16. It says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That would blow the mind of an Old Testament saint. Draw near to the throne of God. The throne of God is the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. I can't go in there. I'll die because I'm a sinner. And the writer of Hebrews now says, don't just draw near. Don't sneak in. and It's draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. And when we draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, what do we receive? We receive mercy and we find, we find grace to help in our time of need. Go over to chapter 10 and look at verses 19 through 22. He says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, and then the writer of Hebrews loves that confidence, conf, go to God with confidence. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I would say that in the context here of this paragraph, the encouragement that we're to give to one another is not just like, hey, you're looking good today. Did you get a new haircut? Did you lose some weight? You on a diet? Like, woo, how'd your baseball team? No, the, the encouragement we are to give is to, to say to one another, go with boldness, go with confidence to God, draw near to God, hold fast to him, Hold fast. He will never fail you. And when you come together and there, there will be people here every week who feel like God is failing and you say, no, no, he's not. I mean, I know it's hard living in this world, but hold fast. Hold fast. That's the encouragement we do is we point them back to Jesus and we say, he is sufficient. He's sufficient. He's all you need. Anything else you will hold on to will fail you eventually. Jesus is the thing that is, is sufficient for eternity to give you that inheritance that you need. So what did Jesus do for you? He's the just, sinless God of the universe who suffered in your place for your sins so that you could draw near to God with full assurance and confidence. That's all. You want some motivation to stand strong in a hostile world? That's it. You have a God that saved you at great personal cost? And that's just the preface to the story. The rest of the story, the longer story, is that he's given you this inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. And Jesus Christ is now spending his time interceding for you. The Holy Spirit has indwelt you if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is growing you and helping you and maturing you. That's our story. That's what Jesus did for us. Pretty good story, right? Pretty good preface. All right, let's get to the footnotes now, verses 19 through 21. I told you, these, these are good, this is good stuff, right? If you ever hear a pastor say that a verse isn't good, um, run out of the church. But, but this is, this is um, these are things that we can get caught up in and miss, get lost of what he just said in verse 18 and what he's going to say in verse 22. So we're going to go through this, but don't get caught up here that you lose the main point that Jesus suffered for you and he is ruling for eternity. Okay? So, Footnote number one, verse 19 through 20, it says, so it says he's made alive in the spirit in the verse of eight, into verse 18, and it says, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, 
because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. This is the hard one. This is the tough one. This is the one that like, you can really get lost on. Like, are, are the spirits that he's talking about there, are they evil spirits? Are they people? People that have died? Um, what's the link to Noah's time? How, how do we understand all of this? And I took great comfort this week from Martin Luther, and this is what he said about this text. He said, a wonderful text is this, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament so that I do not know with certainty just what Peter means. And so if Martin Luther found it hard, I don't feel so bad. So let me give you a couple um, options to what Peter is talking about here when he talks about these spirits who are in prison. This is, these are three that Tom Schreiner gives in his commentary. So the first one could be that this refers to, to people that Christ was preaching to through Noah in the days of Noah, okay? And if that is the case, then these would be unsaved people who uh, God is making a proclamation of victory to, to the people that rebelled at Noah's time. And at Jesus' resurrection, Jesus goes to them and says, I have won, okay? So that's one possibility that it's unsaved people. The second thing is that this refers to Old Testament people who died in the flood and that this is giving them a, a second opportunity at salvation. I, I think that one's just really not good on a variety, for a variety of reasons, but mainly what we read in Hebrews, it's appointed for man once to die and then comes the judgment, is that you have to decide what to do with God and what you have to do with Jesus before you die because that's when the, the, your, your eternity is set. Either you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you spend eternity with Him or you continue in your sin and your rebellion in the passions of your flesh and you spend eternity separated from God and that's just the really nice and polite way to say you spend eternity in hell. It, it, when you die, that, that's it. And so I don't think that second option is the best one. The third option is is that the text describes, or the, when it talks about these spirits in prison, it's talking about um, evil angels that were put into prison um, and that Jesus goes and he, he proclaims to them, I won. Okay? I, I think that's most likely what it is. It could be talking about um, angels and demons that uh, were locked up in Genesis chapter 6. Um, part of why I think this is a good, um, good understanding of this is because in, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, Peter says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, and if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, and he goes on talking about God's judgment. But Peter there is talking about um, angels, uh, evil angels, demons that had sinned and God had locked up. And then you get Jude making a, a similar uh, reference in Jude 6, where Jude says, And the angels who did not stay within their own position and authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. And so Peter seems to have this, um, this understanding, this in mind, that there are, there are demons that God has locked up, maybe since Genesis 6, maybe before that. I, I don't know. I'm going to go with Luther on this. I'm not exactly sure. But I, I think it's part of the third thing, because I think the third option is best that he's referring to, to evil angels, to demons, because of what Peter's purpose is in, in this text, is Peter's purpose isn't to um, get us into to some weird demon, demonology and, and to shift them away from what he's talking about. His purpose in this text is to encourage them to stand strong no matter what happens. And he's just in, at the end of chapter 2, right? He's talked to them about how do you live 
in a world where your government is hostile? How do you live in a world where your boss may be hostile? In the beginning of chapter 3, how do you live in a world where your spouse may be hostile? Well, one of the things that they would wonder about, and I think, how do I live in a world where the a majority of the population buys into the philosophy of Satan and there are angels out, demons out there, evil angels that are working against God. How do I live in this world? Know that Jesus pronounced victory on them already. And so Peter says here that he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. Again, we don't know exactly when that is, but then he makes reference to Noah, so maybe Genesis 6. And then God's patience in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared saved eight people. Like the point is, Jesus proclaimed victory. And this is not referring to where Jesus was between the cross and the resurrection. This is when Jesus rose from the dead, he proclaimed victory. That's the point you need to hold fast to. If he wanted us to know exactly who those spirits in prison were, I think he would have spent more time there. The who they are isn't as important as the fact that Jesus pronounced victory. And whoever they are, Jesus subjected them. Jesus is their ruler. You don't have to fear them. So that's the first footnote. And I think he drives that home in chapter or in verse 22, when he just ends this whole paragraph with angels, authorities, powers are subjected to him. So that's that first footnote. And then the second one is at the end of verse 20. It's, it's this picture of the ark as salvation. It says that in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And so he, he's talking about how the ark was a means of salvation for Noah and his family, the flood was judgment by God on evil people. And God would have been totally justified just to wipe out everyone and be done with the human race. But he doesn't. He's gracious, he's kind, he's patient. And so he waited. He called Noah aside and had him build an ark and that took them quite a while, right? And while they built that ark, the world was just continuing in this flood of debauchery. Everyone loving to pursue the passions of their hearts. But God is patient. And the faith of Noah and his family was demonstrated when they built the ark and then got into it. The ark was the, was the physical means of salvation that God provided. And so we see the ark as this picture of salvation. When they entered into the ark, they were saved. When we enter into Christ through faith by coming to God and saying, God, I'm a sinner and the waters are rising. I have no hope of salvation. Will you please save me? Not based on anything that I am or what I've done, but will you save me based on what Jesus did on the cross? When we enter into Jesus through that confession of, of sin and placing our hope in God, we, we enter into Jesus and, and we're saved. And so the ark is, is a picture of our salvation in that way. And then Peter, to get to the third footnote, ties this to baptism. He says, baptism, which corresponds to this, or so that is similar to this, or symbolizes this salvation. So baptism is also, so the ark is a symbol of salvation. Baptism is also a symbol of salvation. It corresponds to that. So the third footnote is this picture of baptism as salvation. He says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you. So the flood waters were judgment on Noah and his family. When we do baptism, the baptismal waters are a symbol of, of judgment. When I do baptism, something many people ask, I'm surprised. I, I don't know if it's just a... That they think that of my character, but they always want to know, how long are you going to hold me under? <laughs> like, I think I'm offended that they would think that I would find joy in that, but, but why, is that a, why is that a question? It's because going up, we, we understand that being under the water, like there's, there's a possibility of death, right? And, and the baptismal waters are, 
they remind us of that. They remind us that of God's judgment. And so when we baptize, when you're here and I, we say, having baptized you in the name, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother or sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we say, having died to an old way of life. And so it's that picture of, of being dead to the old passions and desires. And I don't know if you always hear it because you're usually clapping and stuff, but then I say, having uh, been raised to walk in newness of life. Baptism is that picture um, and the water is that picture of, of judgment that we're being saved from. And so I don't hold people under for a long time because that's not the picture, right? The picture is being saved from that, of, of coming up. And so that, that's the picture here. That's the corresponding picture. Baptism is a physical demonstration of the salvation that has already happened. The ark was a physical way in which um, they were saved. So, but he says here, he says, now baptism now saves you. And that um, can be confusing to a lot of people. There's a pretty large church pretty nearby that believes that you have to be baptized in in order to be saved. And they they might point to this verse, but I would encourage you to keep reading because he says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. The baptism in and of itself is not what cleanses you. It's not what washes the sin away. What washes the sin away is the appeal you make to Jesus Christ based on his death and resurrection. And then baptism is just a symbol. It's a picture of what God has already done in your heart, that he has saved you. The idea is similar to what we read in Hebrews 10.22 where it says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. It's not that the water washes us, but it's that appeal that we make to God. It's that going to God in full assurance and saying, will you please save me? The conscience in these texts is, is it's, it's not a nagging voice, but a, a genuine, pure heart that goes to God and says, please save me. It's an appeal made on Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's an appeal made from that genuine heart. The baptism doesn't remove the dirt. It doesn't cleanse you. It doesn't wash you or sanctify you. It doesn't provide salvation for you. It does not provide the cleansing you need. If you come up and you get baptized, but you have not, with a genuine heart, said to God, I am a sinner, please save me, you're not saved. It's all about the heart heart. It's all about the heart. Baptism is simply a symbol of your faith. It's a symbol of what you have done, and it's a physical action that demonstrates what God has done in your life. And so when you come and you're baptized, again, and I tell people this all the time, like, and I've I baptized a middle schooler one time, and I said, so when we get to the baptism, do you think life is going to be easier? And he said, oh, yeah. And I said, oh no, it's not. Nothing magical is going to happen. Nothing you know, different is going to happen other than that when you stand up there and you stand in front of a hundred and whatever people are here and you say to them, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and it is my desire to follow him for the rest of my life. I hope you feel the weight of that and that is truly what you are doing. And then what changes is that you now have all of these people that have heard you say you want to live for Christ and it's their desire that you live for Christ and they want to help you to live for Christ and they're a part of the church and you you get baptized here. We're we're assuming you're a part of the church and you're going to stick around. So it is now our intention that you are a part of us and we want to encourage you. And so now you have this whole group of people that is rooting for you and pulling for you. And if you ever mess up, hopefully one of them is going... I, I remember being a kid and being in church and having adults that I didn't know be like, I'm going to tell your mom. <laughs> that was helpful, right? And, not, and we do that with grace and compassion, but we help each other. We help each other battle sin. We help each other battle doubt. We, we weep with one another. We rejoice with one another. And when, when you're baptized, that, that's a part of it. And where life does get easier is now you've identified with this church and all of these people are like, yes, we are on board with you. We are joyfully following you. Side note, 
This is why I'm not, and if, if you've done this, please, I'm not telling you you've done evil or wrong thing, but this is why I'm not a huge fan of vacation baptisms. Like going to Israel and getting baptized in the Jordan. Like I understand that is a cool thing. And it's great to be able to say I've been baptized in the Jordan River. But I think it is a much cooler thing to stand in front of the church that you are identifying with, that you are going to grow in the Lord with and say, I've put my faith in Christ. Please help me to continue to live in this. We need that. We need each other. And so, baptism is that picture of salvation. Baptism is the symbol in which you say, I'm putting all of my faith in Jesus. So these, are these three things, these, these few verses here, he talks about these spirits in prison. He talks about the ark. He talks about baptism. Like Those, those are helpful. They, they help remind us that, that God is in control and what God has done for us and gives us these pictures. But then he comes to verse 22, and I say that this is the story. Verse 18 is the preface. This is the story. I'm not in any way... I was a little worried about using this analogy because I'm not in any way saying that Jesus' death and resurrection is a minor thing. I'm just saying it's short. It was a point in history, a historical fact. Our eternity is based on that, but our eternity and who Jesus is, is is that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that is what Peter comes to here in verse 22. He says, Jesus Christ who has gone into the heavens and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is who Jesus was before creation. This is who Jesus is now. This is who Jesus will continue to be for eternity. He is the one that is over all angels, authorities, and powers. Everything is subject to him. It says that Jesus has gone into heaven. Has gone is the, is the same word that's translated he went back in, in verse 19. And so it's, um, this is not going to heaven. It, it's not leaving on vacation or, or taking a, a siesta or anything like that. It's, it's finishing a task. It is the proclamation of victory. When it says you know, Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected and went to heaven, it's the picture of he has won the battle, he has won the war, there is no more suffering to be done, no more sacrifice to be made. He is the victor, no questions asked. Amen. That's the point when it says he's gone into heaven. Heaven is the domain of God, it's where we picture that God lives and rules from, and that's where Jesus is at. And then it says that he's at the right hand of God, This is not a subordinate position. This is a position of power and authority. So when it talks about Jesus being at the right hand of God, it is that Jesus is the power and authority. This is how Paul says it in Ephesians 1.19. He says, What is the immeasurable greatness of God's power toward us who believe? According to the working working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things under his foot, feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all and is in all. So you get what he's saying there? That Jesus, when we talk about him being the King of kings and Lord of lords, it's that he is far above, far above every rule, every authority, every power, every dominion, and above every name that has ever been named. Jesus is far above that. Forget Alexander the Great, forget Nebuchadnezzar, forget any Caesar, forget whoever you think was the greatest president of all times, nothing compared to Jesus, right? He is the one that is above everything. And then I love that he says, you know, that it's not just this. It's not just this age. This is the forever thing. This is who Jesus is. And then, oh, by the way, this Jesus who is above everything, God has given him to the church. Jesus is the gift that God has given to us. And we are his body. He fills us. He fulfills us. He is where we find our joy and our satisfaction. 
That's who Jesus is. Jesus is ruling the universe. He saved us. He's the greatest force in the universe. And then I love the reminder from Romans 8.34. Jesus is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Interceding for you. I always wanted a big brother that would stick up for me. Like I could have fight my battles. I don't need a big brother. I've got Jesus. How amazing is that? And just to drive the point home, Peter lists the things that they would think would be powers in their lives that they might pray to or they might look to for help. And so he says there's angels, there are authorities, there's powers, but all of that is subject to Jesus Christ. Nothing else you can look to is better than Jesus. We can have confidence and set our hope on Jesus because he's not just some guy that died on a cross a couple thousand years ago. He's God. He's not a passive God either. He's a God that was active in saving you. And he's a God that is active right now in interceding for you and helping you. So thinking back to last week's sermon, and I appreciate Pastor Craig serving us so well, but we go back to that passage in 1 Peter, and we're, we're told to be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. And again, that's not a, a cry to be able to, to give all kinds of statistics on the, the prophecies from the Old Testament and the odds of that. It's a command to be able to say, I am holding fast to Jesus and he is sufficient. I am putting my faith in him. He died once for sins. He's the righteous one that died for me, an unrighteous person. And what did he do? He brought, brought, us, brought me to God. He brought me to God. That's who Jesus is. That's what I hold fast to. That's what I want to be able to tell people. And then we cling to him knowing that he is the one that is, has authority over everything. He's gone into heaven. He's at the right hand of God. And he has authority over angels and powers and anything else. Everything is subject to him. How do you live in a fallen world? How do you live in a world that is hard? You hold fast to these two truths that Jesus suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he would bring you to God and that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's pray. God, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for giving us Jesus. Lord, we recognize that we are sinners, that we have no claim to your grace. But God, in your grace and your mercy, you have saved us, Lord. And God, we pray that that would be the thing that we would hold fast to. God, we pray that we would run with confidence and boldness to you, to your throne, Lord. And there are times where we in our sin are timid, God, where we're fearful. But God, those, those are lies that we tell ourselves, Lord, and where we need to stop listening to those and tell, tell ourselves the things that are true, that you are gracious and merciful and you love it when your children run to you. God, help us to run to you in everything. Help us to be bold as we proclaim our hope to the world that is around us. God, help us to be bold as we encourage one another and point one another to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the inheritance we look forward to. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. Um, if you would like to pray with someone, there will be a couple people here at the front. I'll be here at the front. We'd love to pray with you about anything. But especially if you have questions about having your sins forgiven, being washed, I would encourage you, come talk to one of us. Talk to somebody that you came with today. Uh, there is no better feeling in the world than knowing for sure what your eternity is. And uh, that eternity is set in Jesus. Let's sing together.
If you guys want to take a quick seat, I have just a couple of announcements before we dismiss you guys. Uh, one of them is your connection cards. Um, please fill those out, especially if you're new with us. We'd just love to hear about your visit today and uh, just welcome you to the church. Uh, if you're just a regular attender or a member, if you have any prayer requests or praises, also fill those out. Put them by the basket. We'd love to be praying for you guys in any way we can. Uh, one reminder, uh, this is for you, Craig, and Rick also, but the church office is closed on Monday, so don't come to work. <laughs> so we'll be observing a Memorial Day, so the church office will be closed for the rest of you, so uh, no one will be there. Um, and then one thing we like to do is celebrate anniversaries on the fives. So Mike and Linda Alexander are celebrating 50 years. I do want to see the picture. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> But that's it. That's all the announcements I have for you guys this morning. Um, don't forget that we do have the church picnic. So we will see you back here at 5 o'clock. And uh, have fun at the picnic. And if you don't come to that, then enjoy the rest of your week. So have a good one. What could be?